I'm introducing our next esteemed speaker, um, Professor uh, Mona Jackson uh, will be um, he, um, he's here with us. Um, so the Nati um, uh, Kahunu, uh, um, Rongomai Wahine, and Nagati uh, Porau Tribe of East Coast of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, director of the, um, uh, the Na uh, Kaiwa, uh, Kaiwaka Marama uh, Inu, uh, I, sorry about this, um, Tura, and um, lecturer at uh, Te Wanga um, o Rakawa Otaki. Uh, Moana is a highly regarded lawyer who graduated from Victoria University in Wellington. Um, he was a director of Māori Law Commission and was appointed judge on the International Pur People's Tribunal in 1993 um, and has since sat in hearings in Hawaii, Canada and Mexico. Uh, he was appointed a visiting fellow of Victoria University Law School in 1995 um, and was elected chair of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus of the United Nations Working Group on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, Mona is highly regarded throughout Māoridom and mainstream Aotearoa for his measured and important contribution in the struggle of Māori people um, in terms of uh, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, 1840, sovereignty issues and indigenous rights. Uh, Mona helped develop the original Y 262 claim relating to intellectual property rights for indigenous flora and fauna and rights of Māori over their taonga. Maori, uh, Mona has recently co-chaired a major working group on constitutional transformation um, that was charged with developing a new constitution for Aotearoa based on the Treaty of Waitangi. He has also had extensive involvement in health issues in Aotearoa and, and overseas, ensuring proper and appropriate health care and management of Indigenous peoples. This has included work with the Maori uh, Runanga of the New Zealand Nurses Organisation, uh, with iwi health providers, and participation in several international conferences, such as the gathering of the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, um, and as of yesterday, the Congress of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Nurses and Midwives. So I got to see Mona talk yesterday, and um, I came away um, just with answers, I guess, to some of the struggles I was having, um, or the, the confusion I was having with writing my theoretical framework for my PhD. Um, and his discussion around the imagination and our imagination as Indigenous people and how it needs to um, reflect um, our being, our ontologies, uh, really sung to me. Um, so I'm really looking forward to your, to your yarn today. He's a much-loved dad and koro to his beloved Vanau um, and Mokopuna. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Moana Jackson. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou te, hai, te hau kāinga o tēnei rohe. A nei tēnei tētahi mokopono ngā te kahunu me ngā te parau e mihi atu nei. A he honoru nui tēnei ki a hau ko tāi mai a i rongi i a koutou whenua. A tēnā koutou ngā kai whakahaere o tēnei hui o tātou. Tēnā hui koutou ngā hoa whanaunga nō te wā kāinga o Aotearoa. A tēnā hoki koe e te hoa e tīmata tēnei hui o tātou. A huri nō tēnā tātou. Um, I, I too would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land. It is an honour to be able to walk upon your country. I'd like too to especially acknowledge Lewitcher, um, in whose name the Institute has been named, of course, and it is a privilege to be here with you again today. I wanted to talk today about the three themes that run through this conference of identity, knowledge, strength, and link them to the notion of indigenous rights, and wrap that all around the idea of research. Because when I look, I look through the program, there are some amazing sounding presentations being given over the next couple of days, and one of the difficulties of such a large conference as that is you have to pick and choose which session you will go to when one would really like to go to them all. Um, 
but that very breadth of research raises, I think, some important issues that are related to, in particular, the, the right of self-determination of Indigenous peoples, the history of Indigenous peoples, and the question of who defines what are the interests and what is the knowledge of Indigenous peoples. So I'd like to try and draw all those threads together in, in the time that I have. But I'd like, I'd like to begin, as I usually tend to do, by looking for wisdom from somewhere else. And I often find that wisdom now in the young lives of my mukapuna or my grandchildren, um, who, as I often say, give me absolute joy, keep me sane, and also keep me broke. But I learn such a lot from them all the time. And just recently, my daughter-in-law was teaching one of the grandchildren how to weave. And she had narrow strips of flax, and she was teaching my mokopuna how to weave that into a dodo, which is a small flax bowl or container. And I was watching my granddaughter with her little eight-year-old fingers fumbling around trying to follow what her mother was doing, follow the instructions to make her own little dodo. And when she had finished this amazing first venture into the art of weaving, it was all misshapen and one side was higher than the other, but she was so proud of it and she said to her mother, I'm going to make something bigger next time. To which her mum said, well, we'll take one step at a time. There's more to learn. To which my mukapuna said, it's not what you learn, it's how you learn. And what I'd like to talk about a bit today in trying to draw those threads together that I mentioned is how we learn, how we define what is worth learning, how indeed we define knowledge and the links between knowledge identity, strength, and ultimately the question of political and constitutional power. I'd like to begin with the question of knowledge, because every indigenous peoples that I know, like any culture in the world, develops its own distinctive intellectual tradition. It is a tradition that satisfies the, the basic human urge to know, to find answers, to ask questions, to seek wisdom if possible. And that search for knowledge, that defining of what is important knowledge, is culturally determined. It is shaped by the land upon which the people live. It in turn shapes their history, their relationships, and the way that they see the world. And so each culture, each indigenous nation or nations, developed over time its own acute and astute intellectual tradition. It was a way of knowing their place in the world, their understanding of how that world came to be and how they came to be part of that particular world. And having that intellectual tradition became what we call the papa or the foundation of everything that those people do. It was the source of the institutions that they developed to care for the well-being of their people, to define what well-being meant. It was the foundation which determined the ways in which they made decisions. Because part of every intellectual tradition is the realization at some stage in the life of every community that one cannot live in a power vacuum. That in order to ensure harmonious relationships between people, you have to find some institutions, ways of making decisions which ensure the collective and individual well being of the community. And in the development of those intellectual traditions, there is also an early realization that no community can live in a lawless society. That every society needs some way 
of determining the norms, the codes of behaviour by which peoples will be expected to relate to each other with the land and with the world in which they live. And so those legal traditions, those political structures and systems, like the intellectual tradition itself, like the defining of knowledge itself, becomes a cultural artefact, a product of that culture. There is no one superior knowledge. There is no one superior law. There is no one superior political system. And indigenous peoples grew up in their history comfortable with that uniqueness, comfortable with the understanding that the tribe or the nation or the mob across the valley might have a different way of understanding their world, might tell different stories into their land, might make different decisions in different ways, but that was part of their humanness, part of what made them secure and safe in that place. However, from the 16th century, when most of the states of Europe began to assume that it had the right to dispossess indigenous peoples around the world, had the right to take over the lands, lives and power of those who had done them no harm, simply because they thought those indigenous peoples were inferior and less worthy. A new notion of knowledge, of law, of power was imposed in every indigenous land that was colonized. Colonizing societies, secure in their belief in one superior mono-god, also assumed that there must only be one supreme mono-law, one supreme mono-constitutional order, one supreme mono-knowledge system. And among the many brutal, damaging things that colonisation has done to Indigenous peoples, it has been to convince Indigenous peoples that there is indeed only one way of seeing the world, only one system of knowledge. And that if there is some belated recognition of an intellectual tradition held and treasured by Indigenous peoples, it has a certain quaint exotic interest and may provide some worthwhile perspective on the greater dominant colonizing knowledge, knowledge paradigm, but it is somehow not universal. What is deemed universal has of course been European. And if you take away the knowledge system of a people, if you take away the intellectual tradition of a people, along with the land from which that intellectual tradition drew, along with the political ability to make decisions for the people of that land, then you remove the basic strength and integrity of that people's culture. And so colonization in its operation at many different levels, function to destroy the way in which indigenous peoples knew, the way in which they would choose how to know, as my granddaughter said. And part of the struggle that we are still engaged in today and part of what I hope this conference will address is how we remedy that diminishing and that constant denigration of indigenous knowledge systems. And if you do continue to denigrate or not accord the same respect to those indigenous knowledge systems, then you inevitably affect the ways in which those people see themselves. Because identity in the end the way people understand who they are, how they might know certain things, and indeed what is worth knowing, comes from that intellectual tradition 
sourced in that land. And among the many people who have influenced me in my life, besides my grandchildren, is my grandfather, my mother's father, who we called Kuru. And I find myself now trying less adequately and certainly less romantically and imaginatively to do with my grandchildren what he did with me. He told me stories. He told me what was worth knowing. He taught me to ask questions, to understand that sometimes the answers to a question might just be another question, and that if no answer was immediately forthcoming, it simply meant not that there was no answer, but that perhaps we weren't ready to find that answer. And through the stories which he told, he was actually informing me of the beauty and the richness of our intellectual tradition. And once when I was about 10 years old, we traveled to a small island off the coast of the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand called Waikawa. When Captain James Cook visited our shores, he did as every other colonizer did, he renamed our land. And he renamed this little island that we had known as Waikawa, he renamed it Portland Island, after an associate of someone called Lord Melbourne, who you may have heard of. And I always thought that renaming was not just a colonizing act of taking away some of the intellectual tradition of the land being renamed. It was sort of like a graffiti being placed on the land that needed no embellishment. And we went across to the small island of Waikoa in a little boat, and we landed at a little inlet, which our people call Faifakaro. And Faifakaro means to follow the thought. And that name seemed particularly appropriate for that little sandy inlet, because on Waikoa Island, our people established the first Wānanga, that is the first school of higher learning. And so when the students came to attend that school of higher, land, of higher learning, they landed on that beach called Follow the Thought. Because part of our intellectual tradition was that if you are to know how to know, if you are to understand what is worth knowing, then you need to be open-minded enough to follow the thought to wherever it may lead. Whether it leads to somewhere uncomfortable or somewhere reassuring or somewhere that opens up new vistas of understanding, you follow where the thought leads. And around this little island, you can walk around it in about 20 minutes, a little vents and from those vents at various times, natural gas seeps up. And it makes the water on the island bitter to taste, which is why it was called Waikawa, the place of bitter water. And when the Wānanga, when the School of Higher Learning was in session, the vents were lit. And so flames surrounded the island. And the fiery vent served two purposes. One was to announce that the school was in session. And second, it was also an analogy that knowledge, like the fire, can be dangerous as well as beneficial. That knowledge, like the fire, should be respected and not misused. And so the land of that little island became in itself, in its symbolism and in its physical environment, part of the intellectual tradition. And at the start of each day before the classes began, the students would have to walk from the little inlet, Faifakaro, follow the thought, around the island 
to a rocky outcrop called Titimatanga, which means the beginning. And then they had to walk back again to start their learning for the day. And the reason for that was not just to give them some physical exercise before class, but it was an analogy that if you are to follow the thought, if you are to seek how to know and what to know, then you must go back to the beginning before you can do so. That in order to know what is worth knowing, you have to know that beginning. And in a sense, the identity that people develop for themselves, and certainly which indigenous peoples traditionally developed for themselves, was always a renaming and a returning to the beginning. Most often that beginning was in the land. And the stories that are placed in the land and the songs that are sung into and about the land. And to go to that beginning was to be able to identify yourself as a mukapuna, as a child of that place. And so to know who you were as Māori was to know the place where your beginnings were sourced and it was also to know those who came before you from whom you descended. And in all of the indigenous cultures that I've had the pleasure of visiting and working with and getting to know, there is a similar respect for the land from which they come and a similar respect and acknowledgement of those who had gone before. They were the key ingredients to identifying yourself as indigenous. And that definition required no written confirmation, did not need to be recorded in books. It was simply told in the stories that became part of the intellectual tradition and knowledge of the peoples concerned. What happened with colonization, of course, was that very way of defining who you were was threatened along with everything else that became subject to the whims and power and the greed and avarice of the colonizer. And so when the land was taken, it became harder to trace who you were back to that land. If you were no, no longer able to touch the land, to sing on the land, it became harder to place your identity in that place, to derive your identity from that place. And the colonizers replaced that deeply individual but inherently collective identification with place with ways of defining indigenousness that suited their colonizing interests. And all of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with the whole mythology of the blood quantum, that your identity is somehow determined by the amount of Māori blood, the amount of Cree blood, the amount of Aboriginal blood that you might have. And when I was younger, I used to think it was quite cool to have Māori blood until a scientist friend told me there's no such thing as Māori blood, that blood is all the same. And then I began to investigate where this came from. And it took me ultimately to one of the few texts in the Bible that, that I refer to. And the text says that the namer of names is the father of all things. That whoever assumes the power to define something defines its meaning and defines its purpose. And so to remove the efficacy of the indigenous way of defining indigenousness and replace it with a foreign imposed way of defining, not only disrupted our understanding of what it means to be us, it also caused and continues to cause a measurable heartache and pain to many indigenous peoples. It leads 
to the often hurtful comments that people make, well, you can't be a real Māori or you can't be a real Aboriginal or something, you're too white. As if though that is the determinant of what makes us uniquely Indigenous. And among the many other hurtful things which colonisation has done, it was to remove the comfort of our people being able to define and continue to define for ourselves what it meant to be us. And one of the main contributing forces to that diminution of our intellectual tradition, to the redefining of how and what we should know, to the renaming of what it means to identify as Indigenous, has been the Western intellectual tradition and the offshoot of Western research methodology. There was a presumption in colonisation, which sadly is still present in many countries, that the, because the knowledge systems of the coloniser were deemed, super, deemed superior, then the colonisers could actually understand anything that they regarded as inferior. And along with that went the presumption that the coloniser could research anything and anyone they wished, that it was their right in the universality supposed of their intellectual tradition that they could research, deconstruct, displace, replace indigenous knowledge systems within the constructs which suited their interests. One of the many early colonising researchers in Aotearoa, New Zealand, was a man called Elson Best, who made a statement which, once which seemed to me to sum up the difficulties that we have had and continue to have with the way in which non-Indigenous research treats Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledge. And he made the comment that one of the problems with our Maoris is that they're not given too much thinking that somehow being Māori, being indigenous, being non-white means that you don't think, you are not reasoned, you are emotional. Therefore, we should tell you who you are, what you are, and what and how you should know. And so I was pleased when I read the programme for the conference to see the opening comments from Lewitcher when her name was given to the Institute and what she understood research to be. That research into the lives, the future, the past of Indigenous peoples is something which needs to be defined and controlled by Indigenous peoples. And the struggle for Indigenous peoples around the world to ensure that happens is still a difficult one. It is still difficult to assert that Indigenous peoples are the most capable of researching Indigenous issues and that non-Indigenous peoples do not have some automatic right in the name of what they call academic freedom to research what they wish. Because the term academic freedom is itself a cultural construct. It has summed up most for me every time I look at a doctoral thesis. And I know it's the same here in Australia as it is at home in Aotearoa, New Zealand. That every major piece of academic work in a university, for example, has to have a literature review. What they mean by that literature review is stuff written as literature by white people. Yet in our knowledge system, literature as written is only a recent innovation. But that does not mean that literature did not exist. 
It is there in the poetry, the songs, the history, the traditions of all indigenous peoples. And yet to try to get a university to accept that that way of knowing and seeing the world constitutes a valid literature review is one of those many issues that indigenous peoples throughout the Western Academy continue to wage. So the links between knowledge and identity, the way in which knowledge is used to define identity, go inevitably to the question of the inherent survivability and strength of indigenous peoples. That to be strong is to be secure in who you are, to know your place in the land, to be able to walk that land in freedom and in dignity, and to decide for yourselves how that land should be lived upon. Which brings me to the overarching part of what I'd like to touch on today, and I was pleased that Professor Davis this morning spoke, and I'm pleased that there are other indigenous peoples here who have been involved in the United Nations, and particularly the work in the drafting of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The struggle to get that declaration took over 20 years. But it was an effort by indigenous peoples from around the world to have for the first time at an international level a basic set of indigenous human rights. It was an attempt to restore what indigenous knowledge systems what indigenous legal and political systems always accepted, that is the basic humanness of indigenous peoples. Colonization sought to destroy that humanness. And so the hundreds and hundreds of indigenous peoples who were involved in the drafting of the declaration saw the consummation of the declaration as a little step to restore, to re-acknowledge the humanness of indigenous peoples. It was an attempt to restore the validity and the integrity of indigenous identity, of indigenous knowledge, and through the recognition of humanness, help re-strengthen indigenous peoples. Alone, of course, the declaration was never seen as being enough, but it was seen as part of the wider struggle that indigenous peoples are engaged in. And it was a delight and a pleasure for me to be involved with so many other indigenous peoples, including people from Australia, in the early days of that drafting process. And I remember one incident in particular which highlighted the challenge of the process, the ongoing colonization that occurs in the lives of indigenous peoples, and the desperate need to reclaim that humanness. In 1992, many of the indigenous peoples' delegations from North and South America who attended the working group drafting the declaration in Geneva, wanted to have at the start of the session a minute silence to commemorate the 500 years since Christopher Columbus stumbled into the Caribbean and opened up most of the indigenous world to the plunder and pillage of colonization. The working group is all United Nations bodies, it was made up of states, and alongside them sat the representatives of indigenous peoples. So the chair of the working group approached states to ask if it was all right if we could start the session with a minute's silence. And then she came back and told us that the states were not prepared to allow a minute's silence. The states, however, 
were willing for us to go outside and stand under the trees and have a little ceremony. The response of the hundreds of indigenous delegates was the response one would expect. Anger, frustration, and then a determination that we should go in tomorrow and do it anyway. And so an agreement was made among us that we would enter the assembly, which was a circular room, as most of the rooms at the United Nations are, and we would move around the sides of the assembly. The states would already be there, seated, and then we would have a minute silence. And if states wished to participate, they could. If they didn't, that was fine. But Indigenous peoples felt it was important that we made a statement and exercised our right to honour those who had suffered before us. And so at the appointed time when the states were seated, all of the Indigenous peoples started to move in. And then, as we finished gathering around the sides of the hall, I noticed the first delegation, which was made up of the Aztec peoples from Mexico, were having what looked like a rather heated discussion among themselves. And then one of the elders stepped forward and started to recite a very ancient and a very long Aztec prayer. Then while he was doing that, the group that was next to, next to them, who I think were the Mapuche people from Chile, started to have a similar argument or discussion among themselves. And when the Aztec finished, one of their leaders stepped forward and did a very ancient and a very long Mapuche prayer. What happened then was that each delegation of indigenous peoples around that assembly exercised their right to honour their ancestors through their prayers. And so rather than having a minute silence, we had a three-hour prayer ceremony. (laughs) And in a little way, it was exercising the right which indigenous peoples have always felt, and certainly in the drafting of the Declaration felt, was most fundamental. That is the right to self-determination. And in the Declaration, that right is defined in the following way. Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their social, economic, and cultural development. That articulation of the right of self-determination seems to me to be a recapturing of the authority and the vision that indigenous peoples had exercised for centuries before colonization. It was a restatement of that right which came from the land, which shaped the identity, the knowledge systems, the understanding of what and how to know that indigenous peoples had always cherished. And what I hope will come out now that the declaration is in place is that indigenous peoples everywhere will start to claim the declaration. It is not a perfect document, but at least it is an international statement that once again recognizes the humanity, the unique dignity and special place of indigenous peoples and their right to be human, their right to know what they wish to know, their right to follow the thought wherever the thought may lead them. And so for me, the themes of this conference, identity, knowledge, strength, are interlinked with that understanding of the right of self-determination, which simply means that indigenous peoples have the right to determine their own destiny. 
that no one else can or should decide for them what is in their best interests. And in a much narrower context, no one else should seek to research what that destiny should be. That part of self-determination, as the Witcher said in the opening to the conference program, is that indigenous peoples must decide what is worth researching and why and by whom it should be done, what and how we should know. Two or three years ago, there was a major research conference held at home, organised by some leading Māori academics at the University of Waikato. And international indigenous speakers came and, much like this conference, shared research, shared discussion of questions that they were asking, answers that they were struggling to find. And in the presentation which I was asked to give, I wanted at that time to address the same issue that I'm trying to address today, which is the ethics, really, of research and how an unethical research approach can actually be a colonising act of dispossession. And so at that time, I invented some ethics of indigenous research. I realised when I'd finished that there were 10 of them, and although I have no prophetic pretensions, and I certainly didn't intend them as some profound 10 commandments, friends suggested that I share them with you today. And as I said, there are 10. They are ideas which should underpin, in my respectful view, any research into, about indigenous peoples. The first is what I call the ethic of prior thought. That is, any ethic into a topic of importance to indigenous peoples has to acknowledge prior thought, has to acknowledge the ideas and values which indigenous peoples may have already developed about this topic, bring to bear indigenous understandings about the issue, tell a story which is sourced in the prior thought that has shaped the indigenous intellectual tradition. The second ethic I called the ethic of moral choice. That is the decision to do research is inevitably a moral decision. On what right do you decide to make that research happen? Upon whose authority do you decide it is worthwhile? What is the morality involved in investigating that issue? The third ethic I call the ethic of time. That among the many different things across intellectual traditions, are unique and distinct ways of understanding time. In the Western Christian-based understanding, of course, time is linear. It began with the creation of the world in the biblical book of Genesis and will travel in a straight line until the end of the world. That is a culturally determined understanding of time. Indigenous peoples have quite different concepts of time. Whether it's a circular notion that time turns back on itself, that the past is always with us or in front of us. And there is validity in those different understandings of time. And research into, about, and for Indigenous peoples must be aware of those different constructs in time. The fourth ethic I call the ethic of power. 
that just as the lighting of the fires on the little island of Waikawa was an analogy for the power of knowledge, then there is power in research. The decision to choose the questions that will be asked, the ability to fund research, are questions of power. They are never divorced from the research that one wishes to undertake. And research which does not acknowledge that power, which often fails to acknowledge the imbalance in power, is dangerous for Indigenous peoples. The next ethic I called the ethic of change. That research, particularly in the current often stressed lives of Indigenous peoples, must seek solutions that will bring about change. Change in the lives of Indigenous peoples, change in the relationships which Indigenous peoples have with those who have come to their lands after them. Research which does not seek and promote change, but merely perpetuates the comparison between the negative realities of indigenous life and the normative reality of non-indigenous lives is of little value. Research must promote change. The next ethic which I considered is the ethic of courage. And particularly for indigenous peoples, I think it takes a certain courage to undertake research to try to maintain some integrity within a research environment which is not necessarily conducive to indigenous understandings. But as I've often said, courage is simply the breath you take before you make a difficult decision. And indigenous peoples, among many things, have always been brave and courageous. Those who first walked upon this land in Australia who first sang songs into the land, made peace with the land to live in harmony with it, exercised acts of courage. My ancestors who traveled across the Pacific at a time when most peoples in Europe were worried that the earth was flat and if they sailed beyond the Mediterranean they'd fall off the edge of the world, were brave and courageous people. And so to research today may require some courage, but our people are used to being courageous. And the challenge for non-Indigenous researchers is whether they will be courageous enough to let Indigenous peoples make the decisions about how that decision should happen, about how that research should happen, how it should be implemented, and so on. The next ethic I call the ethic of honesty. If we are to recover from the flawed research that has been done upon indigenous peoples for too long, then we have to be honest about the history of that research. That it too often led to flawed and dangerous policies, genocidal acts of destruction, and an absolute diminishment of the rights of indigenous peoples to be themselves. Research without honesty is also of little value to indigenous peoples. The next ethic that I think in many ways is one of the most important is the ethic of imagination that in all of the stories that indigenous peoples all around the world tell, there is a willingness to merge imagination with fact, to rhyme fantasy with reality, to create a way of seeing the world in all its complexity and wholeness with a certain poetic vibrancy. It runs into the 
objection from Western trained academics that that's hardly objective. But for indigenous peoples, to be objective is actually to divorce yourself from those to whom you belong. It is to divorce yourself from the land which has shaped you. Better to immerse yourself in those to whom you belong and run the risk of being called subjective or emotive. And if you are imaginative, then the honesty comes naturally. And one of the things we need to be honest and then imagine a way through is to name what has been done to indigenous peoples. That whether it's the current incarceration rates of indigenous men and women, whether it's the poverty of indigenous peoples, or whatever the topic, that is the effect of a series of historical causative effectors, causative factors, the two most predominant of which are colonization and racism. Yet we sometimes find it hard to name racism. There is a phrase being used now back home, whenever usually a media personality or someone famous makes a blatantly racist comment, the response is usually, oh, he's not really a racist, and it was just unconscious bias. I understand that when you are unconscious, you are asleep. <laughs> so were those people sleeping when they were being racist? If we are to imagine a future divorced from the past, then we have to be honest about the racism that runs through colonization. And the final ethic, the final ethic is what I call for indigenous peoples the ethic of celebration. That if as indigenous peoples we are to research who we are, all our joys and wonder, all our fallibilities and strengths, then we should also take the time to celebrate our resilience, our survival. We should take time to have joy in what we have managed to keep and what we are, and what we are still able to hand on to those who are yet to come. And for those non-Indigenous peoples who wish to be allies, who may wish to research Indigenous issues, take some simple pleasure in the celebration of what Indigenous peoples achieve. That every time Indigenous peoples exercise their right to self-determination, that is not a denial of your right to be who you are, it is simply a reclaiming of what has been taken by history from us. So I hope in this conference we will learn to be secure as indigenous peoples in understanding our identity, be proud and willing to research our own knowledge systems, and from knowing what to know and how to know, gain strength moving into the future. I thank the organisers. I wish you well. Kia ora.